Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing Mia P. Manansala. Hi there. How are you today? Oh, like I was saying, it's a beautiful spring day, so I'm actually feeling pretty hopeful right now. <laughs> nice. Me too. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful morning. So can you tell me about your book? Sure. So my debut, Arsenic and Adobo, comes out May 4th. It is a Filipino-American themed culinary cozy mystery. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, cozy mysteries are, you know, kind of think of like the hallmark of mysteries, you know. So even though, yes, there are dead bodies, there is no gore, there's no on the page, like graphic sex or violence or anything like that. I basically wrote something that my mom could read. Um and it basically follows the protagonist, Lila Makapagal, who's a young woman um, who has to return to her small hometown after kind of a failed relationship. And um, her aunt's business is kind of floundering. And so she got called to kind of save it. And while she's trying to help her family revitalize the restaurant, her ex-boyfriend turned very vindictive food critic. <laughs> um, has the bad taste to just die in her aunt's restaurant and she becomes the main suspect. So the book is her trying to save her, both her uh, family's, you know, restaurant reputation and then also keep herself out of jail. Yeah. And it is really an excellent book. As I was, as I was saying to you before the interview started, <laughs> it's so much fun. And there were so many points now I'm at the point now where I'm like, I have no idea who it is <laughs> who keeps killing the people. I'm like, just, uh, suspecting everyone and that's great excellent that's what I want to hear <laughs> um so you also have a, a business you do book coaching can you tell mm -hmm. me about that sure so I am a certified book coach I took um, a course through author accelerator of uh, that's about six months to get to the certification um so before this, I, you know, I was a teacher for almost a decade. I was an English language instructor. Um, sadly, the company I was working for closed at the beginning of the pandemic last year, and I needed um, something that I could do remotely until I kind of, you know, got back on my feet and figured what I what I wanted to do. Um, because writing, <laughs> as wonderful as it is, and as much as I love it, um, is not something I can live on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, um, so I took that. And the reason I went with that, like one, when I said I was a teacher too, I really love helping other writers and giving back to the community. Um, so back in 2017, I was part of a mentor organization, like pitch contest organization called Pitch Wars. And I learned so much through that experience that the year after that, I partnered up with my, my then mentor, now co-mentor and friend, Kelly Garrett. And since 2018, we have been mentoring um, through that program every year. And, um, you know, I, it, I just looked at it as like a great way to give back to the community, a great way to lift up other like marginalized voices since Kelly and I specialize in um, crime writers of color, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone who applied to us, but we, who didn't choose in the end, but she made our top, she, you know, emailed us and she was like, well, would you consider being my coach? And I didn't know that was, I didn't know that was a thing. I, I, had didn't never, <laughs> I had never heard of it before. So I did some research and I was just like, oh, this is what I do as a mentor. Only I could get paid for it, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> so I did the research and like, even though like technically I had the general skills, I wanted to make sure to go to that course because like, if you are going to be paying for a service, I should be giving you the best of me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a creative, I, uh, I'm not a business person. So like the business aspect as well, I wanted to make sure that, you know, like what are the correct fees? What is the contract? You know, we need oh, to start yeah. establishing boundaries um, because like a coach, you know, it, you know, it's not just like a, a developmental editor, like an editor will read your work. They'll give you some feedback and they're like, here you go. Right. But like as a coach, like I like, yes, obviously I give you feedback and everything, but I'm also your accountability partner. Right. Like there's mm -hmm. a deadline. You have to turn it into me because you paid for this. Um, I'm your cheerleader. I'm there to like, look, I get it. Writing is so hard, <laughs> um, you know, and like if you want to give up, you have to do what's right for you. But maybe, you know, have have you tried this? Have you tried that? You know, and then try to talk them through these things. So it can be like a very, very personal 
relationship. So like kind of knowing how to navigate those waters um, was one of the things that I learned in the course. That is really awesome. Yeah. My parents are currently working to become life coaches. And oh. so I was reading that on your website. Now that you expl- uh, talking about that, I was like, this all sounds very familiar. Just in a different niche. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so how did you get into writing cozy mysteries? Well, cozy is in particular. So my mom is the one who really got me into mysteries. Like I've been a big reader all my life and I've always enjoyed um, mystery, you know, starting from like way back when with Encyclopedia Brown, Um, Mm -hmm. like when the Babysitter's Club had a spinoff where they also were solving mysteries. I was like, this is the best thing ever. Yes, um, I remember that. I, I, every time I hear about that, I'm always like, "What was that? what was this mystery babysitter?" I mean, club? like the '90s were wild. Um, my mom was also like a big fan of like Mary Higgins Clark, which again, you know, like you know, like more traditional, not very like gritty or, or gory or anything like that, uh, is what we tend to prefer. Um, and then so. You know, with we particularly like the culinary cozies, which again I didn't mm. know was a thing um, until she introduced them to me. And I'm just like, I love food, I love mysteries. Like the fact that I can kind of mash these together um, and bring like a perspective uh, and from you know that we don't really see in many uh, cozy mysteries. Uh, now. I mean, it's it's so much better now. Like there's amazing, huh. much many more diverse books. But like when my mom first started getting me into them, you know, like on the shelves, I wasn't really seeing a lot of experiences that look like mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so like, how did you, what gave you the idea to translate your love of food onto the page and not just in reading about it? Well, like again, so like, I love the culinary cozies. And then, so for me, I guess it was like two things. Um, I feel like I've said this a million times, but because I'm bringing a Philip, like I'm Filipino American, I'm writing Filipino American characters. Food is such a big part of culture. And especially me as like a diaspora kid, like I was born and raised in Chicago, right? I don't speak the language. I've never lived there. I've only visited like a handful of times. So food is kind of like a shortcut to, to the culture, right? It, it's what I, what I can cling to, what, what, something that's very tangible and that I feel that I know. And then also, um, and I hope this comes through in my book, but but the idea of like food as a love language. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. you know, like in my family, at least, you know, like um, the food stuff is very heavily based like on my father. Cause you know, he typical old school stoic, you know, Asian man, there were, there were no like verbal, I love yous, you know, like, like hugging and like physical affection wasn't really a thing, but he was the cook in the family. Mm-hmm. And so he showed love through the food and the care that he took, you know, to, to take care of us. Yeah. And so like it, if, if I'm writing about family, there's no way I can't also write about food is, is how I feel. Because those two things in my mind are just they're connected in complicated ways. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. For me, I, I'm actually a food blogger. So, oh. <laughs> and so as I, and I, and I live in Chicago. So oh, I, I was right. reading this and I was like, oh, my gosh, this book is so perfect. Like I connected with it on so many levels. And I know and I can sometimes have like food be my love language in certain areas. Mm-hmm. And I have know a lot of people who that is. And like this book really struck a chord with me and I recommend it for anyone who has those same <laughs> feelings. Well, honestly, just everyone. It's a really, <laughs> really great book. Thank you. So were there any storylines that were harder for you to write than others? Or like any characters in particular? Um, I'm not going to say characters, though. So this also ties into like those of you who are writing mystery. Um, <laughs> just because it's fiction doesn't mean you don't you can just make it all up. Um, mm-hmm. So in an early version of this, um, I had my protagonist, Lila, get this uh, like a cr- like at the t- like it, I had to change it slightly. But at the time, it was a crucial bit of information Um from her cousin who who was a nurse in the book um and i sent it to two beta readers one uh they're both mystery writers one was a lawyer and the other is in the medical field and both of them like if you could scream through text they were like this is so illegal she cannot just be giving oh. out client inf-. you know it's one of those things where like oh uh, yeah hip like client oops. confidential they like she yeah. just can't be handing out files willy-nilly you know without it being this a like, gross <laughs> You know, yeah. yeah. And I was just like, oh, my God, so much of the next like 
arc of, of like the second act relies on her having this information. Mm-hmm. Right. But I couldn't just like hand wave it being like, well, her cousin doesn't care. She just wants to, like, no, like that's that's not <laughs> one. That's not who that character is Two, you know, it's just so unethical. I, you know, I couldn't do it. So like I basically had to rewrite an entire storyline because um, because of that information. And like, you know, but it's better this way. Right. Like it, like, it was painful. Like at the time I had only written half. So like because like I had a feeling so I was like, I need to see if this makes sense and is going somewhere. Mm-hmm. No, it did not. <laughs> also, like I had to, you know, so the first act was fine, but everything that stemmed from that that piece had to be completely rethought. And, um, which is better though, because if you really think about it, I was taking the lazy way out as a writer. I was like, I know this person, let me show up. They will give me the information, zero work involved. And like, that's not you know, that there's, there's no conflict. She's not really working for it. You know, people just handing her information willy nilly that doesn't really, you know, go anywhere. So I had to think of different ways for her to have to work for the, inf- the clues and the information that she finds. So it, it, it was a, it was a, it was a kick in the pants, but it was a nice reminder. Yeah, definitely. I was actually just about to say, well, that caused you to have so many more creative ways of her getting that information exactly in order for the story <laughs> to progress like that. And I, I thought that was something that was really cool. Um, so you mentioned having your some of your friends looking through it and them screaming at you mm-hmm. <laughs> over text. <Yes. laughs> um, what other sorts of research did you do for this book? Well, like I, like I'm definitely like on an FBI search because like looking up like best way to you know, like like looking up various ways to kill someone and like oh how, aren't we aren't all writers <laughs> on those search lists? Let's be honest here, you know, and that you know especially like various kinds of poison and like what effect and like how much and this you know so like there there was just so much poison research in particular that was in um even like really minute things like because part of it and you know like now that uh, her her aunt's restaurant is involved it's like well what does happen if there's a death in someone's restaurant you know like legally mm-hmm. like what like the food you know, the health inspector and then you know things so like some of it i was able to hand wave because it's like um it's set in a fictional Midwestern town. So I'm like, well, maybe in that county, that does, but, it, but some of it, like I, it needs to be based on, you know, some yeah. reality. I didn't want to just make up whatever I wanted. Cause again, that's just, that's making it too easy. That's doing the lazy way. Um, so like <laughs> restaurant regulations were things I looked up. Um, and like, you know, even though like I'm a Filipino American writing a Filipino American, I hired a uh, sensitivity reader who is who like lives in the Philippines. Like she's a homeland Filipino just to make sure I got certain parts of the culture. Right. You know, because there is a huge gap in my knowledge. You know, I I will never, ever say that I, I speak for all Filipinos or even Filipino Americans like mm-hmm. with my portrayal. Like I only know what I know. Um, but because I was using some Tagalog phrases in there, because I was writing um, multi generational, so some of the characters or immigrants, like they born and raised in the Philippines who came later, and I'm not an immigrant, so like I wanted to, you know, so a whole like someone born and raised there would have a very different viewpoint than someone born and raised here in the U.S. So I wanted to make sure that I was being fair, that I was being, you know, mm-hmm. giving these people like well rounded perspectives as opposed to be like, eh, whatever, I'm pretty sure this is how it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And that's something really important for all authors to do too. Like, especially <laughs> if you're writing from a perspective that you're not as comfortable writing from, or even in your case where you were to a degree to have people going, okay, maybe change this thing, but maybe mm-hmm. this, like this doesn't sit too well or mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Like that's, that's something that I wish more writers did actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, even small things, you know, because like I was writing because like some of the intergenerational and also, you know, uh, things that they, they struggle with in there. I was writing it very much from my perspective. And then so like my reader was just like, well, you know, she's being really harsh because like if you really think about it, you know, if her grandmother because uh, like the grandmother is very much old school, traditional. This is how you do it. And it's very frustrating for Lila. And then the, the, the reader was just like, well, if you think about it, this is literally her only tangible connection to her homeland mm-hmm. that she hasn't been to. And, you know, like it, it's it's more than food to her is the way she said it. And I was just like, 
oh, like I never thought of it like that. Like, you know, the reason she's so rigid is because it's it's her only connection, you know, and like, yeah. like, you know, like little things like that helped me develop the characters in so many ways that like I had never really thought of because, you know, parts of it, like I was basing that woman on my grandmother and I had some feelings and she was just like, well, I'm just like, okay, you're right. You're right. Okay. (laughs) 3d let's make this 3d as Mm. opposed to just one-sided. Yeah. That was actually something that I really loved in it too, where, cause you still let her be upset with her grandma and everything, Mm. but she still said in the end, like, well, this is her connection though. And this Mm -hmm. is, this is still, I still understand where it's important. I thought that was something really good showing that added more dimension to Lila as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I had to give her some maturity because she is kind of a brat and uh, like, I did that on purpose, but (laughs) I need to let her get some of (laughs) it. So how did you start writing? (sighs) Like that's, um, it's one of the things like I always knew I'd wanted to write, you know, I did a lot as a kid, but I'd never finished anything, you know, for, for, oh. for the majority. Yeah. Right. Same. <laughs> so many started stories when I was younger. Um, but I'm going to give some very specific dates, but I know this because it's based around certain things. So um, I spent almost four years teaching English abroad in South Korea. And so you know, I had a great time was written and I came back and at some point I was just like, oh, like I had all these ventures, but now like I'm back at home in the same place doing the same thing. I don't even have a full time job because I came back and I started working part time teaching English, which was what I was doing before. And I was like, is this is this it? Like, you know, I was 29. I was going to be turning 30 soon. Um so I, I, and then I remembered, I'm like, well, you really loved writing. Like, why don't you give that a shot? And I had never taken a creative writing course. Like I was an English major, but I'd never taken creative writing um, because that's expensive. <laughs> so like one day, like 2015, I literally, it was like, some, I just Googled, I was like Chicago creative writing. And then one of the top searches was for um, a place called Story Studio Chicago Mm-hmm. And they had a one day writing workshop for mysteries. And at the time, I didn't know like I was going to be a mystery writer. Honestly, I always thought I would do like kid lit or maybe like fantasy or something like that, because that's what I was into when I was younger. But I was like, well, I really love reading mystery. Uh, maybe I could write one someday, you know, and it was reasonably priced because it was just one day. So I went and like during the class, I came up with an idea that like I really, really loved. And I kind of started writing it a little bit. And the instructor, uh, Lori Raider Day, read it and she was like, is it, have you written anything before? I was like, no. She's like, I think you're a mystery writer. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. I, actually, I actually had never heard of that place. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, that, I, I, re- I really love that. Mm-hmm. It's by the, uh, the Irving Park Brown Line. So. Oh, cool. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. 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 I, will, I will look that up after this interview. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, she was um, super, sorry, like, you know, I just want to let the know, like, it, how important it is to have people who are there supporting you, because uh, Lori not only said that to me, she was also, at the time, the president of the Mid- uh, Mystery Writers of America Midwest, and she was like, hey, we have free meetings, I really think you've got something, you should come check it out, you know, and then, so you know, and kind of went from there, like, she, you know, I went to the meeting, she was like, ah! And she, you know, so she really kind of took me under her wing to make me feel comfortable, to make me feel like I was part of the community. Mm-hmm. And it like, it made all the difference. Uh, Cause yeah. without her, like maybe I would have had this great idea and just like not knowing what to do with it. Um, but she kind of stuck, <laughs> stuck with me there. <laughs> that is really awesome. And that does happen to so many writers where it's like, oh, you have the best idea, but it will never see the light of day because mm-hmm. you just didn't know where and that, that's really awesome that you had someone like kind of guiding you in that mm-hmm. so has your work with other writers by doing your book coaching influenced your own writing oh yeah definitely um like that's what I always encourage people to like get into like good critique groups and things like that because writing and critiquing are two different skills right and reading other people's writing in like and analyzing it will make you realize 
things about your own writing that you don't even that you didn't think about before because you're looking for things in particular because you don't want like you know your critique group shouldn't be like oh this is great congrats like like they should be analyzing and helping you get better right not tearing it apart right it's constructive criticism but they should be able to to point out things that maybe that disconnect between what's in your head and what's on the page that's what they're there for to to ask questions to poke holes and things like that um yeah and like through the course, you know, like obviously like we, you know, I, I learned like tools and I have these resources that I didn't have before that I use in my own writing, not just with my clients. Like when I take on new clients and I, and I give them like a particular kind of homework, like, the, like the, we have a special like outlining method that we use and, you know, and I show them my own outline. I'm like, look, I'm not, you know, this is not like say as I do, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Like I use it in my own writing and here's how I find it helpful. And they're like, oh, you know, showing them real examples of how it's used and really not, good. yeah. And not just like, well, this is what I was taught. So here do this you know I, I see the difference it makes so I take it you do like outlining yeah to, to a point yeah I love I, I don't love it but you know now that I'm on deadlines <laughs> and yeah, yeah and and I like the method that I learned through author accelerator it's called inside outline because um like my mentor Kelly Garrett she comes from the screenwriting world so for her her outlines are intense she will speak you know, she'll write like 13, 14, 15 page outlines and they work for her. Right. So that when she's drafting, it's tight, but that's not me. And that's not, you know, a lot of other people, but I do need to know the shape of the story. Right. Yeah. Here are the biggest things. This is what I'm working for. Here's the arc I'm aiming for and the, and why I'm going for it. So like, once I have those mapped out, both the outside and the internal like character emotional journey that's what I need yeah I, I'm the same as you on that front um I was I wrote an outline for a book I wrote and it was like a page or two it was very very short just bullet points and then I talk get on here and I talked to all these writers and so many of them are like I write 50 page outlines and I was mm. like I thought mine was long <laughs> No, like with the inside outline, like uh, Jenny and Ashley, see how she's like three pages max, because after that, you're just like mm-hmm. getting into the weeds, like because you want to figure out the bones of your story, basically. Yeah. Like, does it even hold up? Like just these few things or like, do you have to spend more time thinking about it? So like yeah. that, that's how I like to say, you know, because, you know, with my clients, like, you know, some of them are pantsers and I'm just like, well, you know, how about you try this? It's I'm not making you write down every single scene I just need to know that you know the important bits of your story and why they're important to the story Mm -hmm. um and then that that's it yeah (laughs) and I I think very much uh, this has happened to me so much but the writing down every bit of the scene can really bog people down Mm -hmm. and be like no no no, I I am only a pantser I will not (laughs) plan any of the things and like it is really good. Thank you for helping other writers and like showing yeah. them like <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a beautiful compromise, people. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. Huh? Um. So, yeah, I think that was all the questions I had for you today. I just have one final one, though, and that mm-hmm. is what do you have coming up? Yes. So Arsenic Adobo comes out May 4th. It's the first in the Tito Rosie's um, Kitchen Mystery series. Book two, um, I, I turned it in. I'm waiting for the edits to Ooh. come. The um, For Hot Tip, the title is Homicide and Halo Halo. Ooh. And the tentative release date, you know, it's subject to change. Tentative release date is February 2022. And I'm in the middle of drafting book three. Um, Everything happens at once, people. <laughs> once you yeah. get into publishing, it's a million deadlines all at once. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, that is so awesome. Well, I will definitely <laughs> keep an eye out for that. As I said multiple times in here, your book is so much fun. It's so good. Um, yeah, and I recommend anyone listening to this, go check out all of your work and your book coaching thing, because that is so, so cool. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for coming on. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Um, all right. For Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. And I'm Mia P. Manansala. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after, the The end. end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. 
This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at readbetweenthelinespodcast. Thank you so much for listening.